Hey guys, Loman02. Uh, welcome back for some more Canadian uh, Highlander content. Um, I am playing, again, Black White Death and Taxes here. This is my opening hand. I'm playing against Ben Wheeler. I know that he's on a bug pod list, um, and I was kind of curious to see how this deck could fare against it. Um, this hand's not the best on the draw. It's not the worst. The, the, the thing that kind of stinks about it it doesn't have a one drop to put pressure on him, but it does have a dark confidant, which if it gets to stick around for a turn, could provide me some pretty good value. Um, I'm hoping on his opener he doesn't have a turn one mana door, because that allows him to do a lot more by turn two. Like possibly play a pot out. He goes ahead and gets down a death right shaman, so mana dork has been actualized. I just play out a tapped godless shrine. He goes ahead and gets down Sylvan Library, which is not great for me. Now, I pull what I consider to be a, a good card in the matchup, Hushwing Griff. Hushwing Griff kind of does hose my own hand, but if it gets to stick around, it could very possibly win me this game um, due to the fact that um, he's playing a bug pod list that relies on a lot of ETB or value-based creatures uh, that have effects when they come into play. So it's basically a my creatures or spells deck. It's actually it, it, the, the this version of the bug pod list is more of a combo uh, list that that circles around spell seeker and uh, and regrowth and time walk and a pod chain off of the Seeker finding the Time Walk to continually get Time Walk back through Eternal Witness, uh, uh, Vanifar, Body Double, Marine, um, and eventually Progenitor Mimic, which copies um, the Eternal Witness. So basically, like it, it, it uses that to kind of generate a, a pretty degenerate chain of Time Walks, so that it eventually attacks you to death or, or, or whatever. It just kills you because you never can take a turn again. But a lot of it's predicated upon ETB. So Hushwing Griff's kind of cool in here. Hushwing Griff's also just kind of like some tech against uh, um, the uh, the blue-red like uh, twin decks, if there's a, uh, still a twin deck around. I don't think a lot of them play it anymore. But it's a pretty strong card. Um, that said, you know, uh, we we kind of have a lot of ETB effects ourselves to include the uh, Recruiter of the Guard and the Palace Jailer. So I, I'm not exceedingly happy to have kind of those nombos going on right now, but it's one of the things you kind of sign up for when you're playing taxi cards, and sometimes your own cards get each other. So we end up getting uh, Hostage Shakered on the Bob, which kind of stinks. I'm planning on leaving up the Hushwing Griff here to see if I can get him, possibly. He goes for a him to Turk, which is a great play. Um, and note, he's been drawing cards like a madman off Sylvan Library. I do not blame him. I play this card out because I think it's relevant enough, but unfortunately he has a spell removal card for it in the form of Collective Brutality. Um, all right, so this is an interesting play on my part. Like, I, I, I have a couple lines here, right? Like, I, I don't think the line is just go for a porcelain legionnaire because my opponent's on an active Sylvan library with a fetch land to get rid of any nonsense he does not want, and he's been drawing a lot of cards off it. The reason people draw cards off of Sylvan library is either because they're really bad and they don't want to have them on the top of their deck and they want new cards, or they draw them because they're really good. And if they have a fetch land in, in play. In my mind, it means they're probably really good because they're going to, you know, they, they they didn't have to keep them if they have a fetch land in play, right? Um, they could have just taken the fetch land, shuffled them away, and then kept the next, you know, two cards they wanted to for eight life. Um, That all said, like, it, high risk, high reward, right? I go for the high risk, high reward play, and I play out the Palace Jailer on the Hostage Shaker, fully knowing that this has exceedingly high blowout potential for me. And boy, does it ever end up going that way. The problem I kind of run into is if I go recruit to the guard and try to set up my following turn, I feel like I'm possibly not going to get the turn pass back to me. So I want to take away their four here. The reason I want to take away their four is because if they do have a, the ability to Eldritch Evolution or Pod on this turn after stealing my Dark Confidant, then uh, or Natural Order, I can't remember. I think Natural Order is not their deck, it's too many points. Um, I, I, I don't want a four to be in play. Uh, it's It was actually more of a call based around the card's uh, converted mana cost. They do actually have Eldritch Evolution, which is still able to get uh, the Phantasmal Image, which which owns me. It just totally gets me. Because he ends up copying my Palace Jailer, stealing my Palace Jailer, which you know leaves me with a Dark Confidant, but gets their Hostage Taker back, steals my, my Dark Confidant, and now it's going to be very, very difficult to steal back the Monarchy. So, and they have the time walk, and I'm just like, all right, you know, I, I let them play it out. And, and, it, and the cool thing about this game is that you get to actually kind of see how their deck plays out. Because uh, I let them do it. They go Spell Seeker, I believe, into Regrowth here. Uh, actually, no, I don't want to play this one out. The next one I'll have to play out. They get Regrowth here. And they're going to get Time Walk with Regrowth. Uh, they're going to probably sack something with the uh, the uh, um, Frexian Tower. Uh, tap Green off Bayou. Regrowth, Time Walk. Time Walk off of uh, um, Tropical Island. They're drawing... Uh, 
a lot of turn. They're drawing. Uh, um, they're looking at, at, at three cards a turn, plus drawing a fourth, uh, with two new fresh cards every time they get to have another turn. Um, I, I have faith that they're going to combo me out. Uh, in a minimum, this accounts for four damage this turn. And if they don't do anything else to develop the board situation as it is, then I'm going to be taking five plus three, eight plus four this turn. So. I don't think it's very likely they're going to do nothing to develop the board, but I'm pretty much just dead to what's on board right now, so I go ahead and pack it in because I know how their deck works. Uh, the next game, you do get to kind of see their deck play out, though, in the time walk. So, quick pause, guys, and I'll go to the second game in this match set, uh, Black, White, Death, and Taxes versus Bug Pod. All right, guys, I am back. All right, this hand is on the verge. Like, I don't really like this hand because I think it could have long-term mana issues. It's got two threes in it. Doesn't have three mana. It's got an uncolored source in the form of Muta Vault, but it has a removal spell. It has a one drop, and it has a Thalia, which could possibly slow them down to an extent. I keep it because I think it's better than most sixes are. Um, get Scrubland, play out my two one. They play on a tap land, which is, is fine by me. I draw a four drop. So one of the things you'll see, I get, I get punished this game. I have a rough draw. I draw a ton of four drops. And there's not a ton of four drops in the deck, but I continue to draw four drops like a champion. When I do this, my opponent has to be jumping for joy uh, when I activate the Muta Vault. And then I see Caracas, and I'm like, oh, gosh, God, or goodness. Uh, I do draw into a Collective Brutality, which is uncastable due to my own Thalia, so maximum punishment on my own cards, right? Um, they make a, a good play here. So I had two lines here. I, I, I actually just want to get the damage in with Thalia. Um, if I activate the Muta Vault, they're going to bounce my Thalia just in response to the activation of Muta Vault, so it still gets in the same amount of damage. And there's a chance, like, and I, I give them the room to make the mistake because I'm kind of just hoping at this point, because I know what my hand contains and it's not land, to actually cast real spells. Uh, they actually Caracas mid-combat, so I'm able to free up the Collective Brutality, and I'll probably just pitch the Thalia uh, at that point because I know she's not going to be sticking around on the board. But they intelligently do it on end step. Um... This turn, they play out of Kitchen Finks, which is not something this deck really wants to see. Not the worst. I finally draw my land, which is kind of nice. I just get rid of the Finks. Um, I figure they don't have time to pop the clue right now. And if I'm lucky, they don't have a good follow-up play, but they, they have a time walk. They have a Spell Seeker to get, I believe, Green Sun Zenith, which is going to get uh, the Eternal Witness. Is what my guess is. Because it was either Green Sun Zenith or, or a Growth, depending on what their hand contained. If it's Green Sun Zenith, it means they're getting Eternal Witness. Eternal Witness gets back Time Walk. They get me for one, down to 18. Taste it. They have the Regrowth in hand, get to Time Walk again, play out Sylvan Library to filter their draw step, but they're down to two cards, so they could possibly miss here. It's not likely they're going to miss, but it is very possible. They leave back the Eternal Witness. I don't know why. They pass the turn back to me. I just cast out the Soldier of the Pantheon. I don't end up collective brutalitying them, um, and it's it's hard telling if it's right. Oh, this is why they don't attack. They don't want to get like blown out some random way, because um, I had Muta Vault available, and they wanted a Venser. Um, so this is kind of a cool combo they've got going on. Uh, Venser with Caracas plus Eternal Witness means that once they hit ten mana, they basically have a Mind Slaver lock. So as opposed to like a thirteen mana requirement for Mind Slaver lock with Academy Runes. Um, this is a 10-mana lock, uh, so what they do is they Venser their Eternal Witness every turn and Time Walk. So it's 4-mana for Venser, 3-mana for the Ewit, 1-mana uh, tied up in Caracas, which takes it up to 8-mana, um, plus 2-mana for Time Walk every turn, uh, requiring a total of 1 white if you're taking Caracas out of the equation, uh, 3 blue and 2 green, so it's a 10-mana combo, essentially. Uh, but they're not at 10-mana yet, so I'm going to let them go through it and see if they can get there off of their Sylvan Library. They're very likely to. So they Ewit again, get the time walk back again. They're down to three because they've been drawing like crazy off of the Sylvan Library, which is really smart. They actually blow up their own Eternal Witness here because they weren't assured to find their land. But what they're going to do is uh, down tick Liliana, get the Eternal Witness back so they can have an assured time walk this turn to get after more draw steps off of the Sylvan Library. Time walk again. Cast out a Coiling Oracle looking for land. They find land, and at this point, they are up to nine mana. They collected Brutality Me. So one of the reasons, like, I did actually have a pragmatic reason for playing this out. One of the pragmatic reasons for playing it out is if they do miss, 
Um, they were at uh, three life before. So if they fetch or do anything that ca causes them to lose any life, and somehow the turn gets passed back to me, I actually do have the ability. I have reach. I have I have burn in hand with collective brutality because it can take away two life. So I was kind of like one of my hopes. Um, they're just going ham here. Get another time walk off of the regrowth, which was uh, cast back by Snapcaster. Um, and they find their 10th land, and I pack it in there. As soon as they have their 10th land, there's no point in me playing out because they're just going to, um, they're going to, they're going to bounce every turn and just, and just get tons of value. I mean, they have Snapcaster here. Um, so actually at this point, um, I think just attacking me to death works, like with Lumbering Falls and like, uh, the, the Treetop Village. But more than likely what happens is like a village possibly gets in there and they bounce the Snapcaster. They could even probably exile the Time Walk right now and it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, for them, but I'm very, very dead uh, at this point, uh, regardless if they're at five life or not. And that's kind of how this bug pod deck works. It's very, very interesting. And it's funny to me. I, I think you know I've played this this black, white, death, and taxes list uh, a decent bit against the uh, uh, the Victoria Canadian Highlander players, and I have not tended to fare well with it. Um, I think the build is a little dated, um, and it probably needs some work. It's funny because it actually has done very well on Moto uh, for me. However, it's not fared well against them, and I think it probably needs to be reworked. It's one of the things I was actually talking to Ben about is that, like, Death and Taxes for me is, like, a weird deck because, you know, it's essentially a, uh, a watered-down white weenie beat-down deck that is hot tech to beat, you know, unfair decks, right? So it's actually a strictly worse white weenie deck, against white weenie decks. So worse aggro decks, I guess what I mean to, uh, mean to say. So as far as, like, counting to 20, it's actually a worse deck, because it generally plays less creatures that are more interactive, and then, you know, more interactive spells like Clutch Brutality. But, like, a pure white weenie de deck that's, like, 53 creatures or 50 creatures, as opposed to, like, the 42 or whatever this deck runs, uh, will tend to overrun this style of deck. It tends to be better against, like, red deck wins as well. Uh, but tends to be a lot worse against stuff like Bug Pod. Um, I just think my hate pieces uh, tend to line up oddly. And it's also possible I'm po pro possibly playing the deck wrong as well. I tend to look at this deck as more of an aggro control deck, so I may have been a little uh, less um, active than I should have been. Um, and I fully acknowledge in the first game that the Palace Jailer play was uh, was dubious at best. I think most things I did there were very dubious. I mean, I could have uh, I could have searched for a two toughness or less creature, uh, but there were not many that were going to get me out of that situation, and I could not have cast many of them that were relevant on that given turn. So I think the Palace Jailer play was right, given my knowledge of what Ben's playing. And then this match kind of got mana screwed, um, so we really didn't get to you know open our wings and fly with the uh, the black white death and taxes list. Um, but you do get to kind of see what their deck does, which is very very sweet. Like I I I'm in love with this list that Ben's got built here. I think this list is is gorgeous. Like I I just you know it, it was funny to me because I was looking at the points list and like I I honestly the first time I looked at it and I haven't been looking at the format all that long is um. I didn't understand. I was like, I look at Time Walk, and I'm like, what deck really wants Time Walk? And I was like, ah, probably some sort of like fair mid range deck, right? But the cool thing that they kind of done with this list, this Bug Pod list, is they've like put it in what is apparently a a you know a fair mid range list that could do some pretty unfair shenanigans with Time Walks. It's very very abusable by this list, which I think is kind of like you know. You know, looking at how the, the, the Victoria Canadian Highlanders, you know, build and play their decks, um, you know, they abuse, maximally abuse the points that they put into their list. And that's one of the things that, like, I really appreciate about his list is that, you know, he's got time walk in there. And it's not just, like, a, a single value time walk, I attack you for lethal on the next turn. It's, I'm going to time walk, like, six or seven times and accrue so much value that it's an avalanche that you're never going to get out of. And it's very, very cool to kind of see it operate and see it work um, in, in this list. So anyways, guys, quick pause, and I'll come back for the next game I played against Ben, uh, I believe, yesterday afternoon. All right, guys, back momentarily. All right, guys, back. So I kind of wanted to test this matchup. Uh, I was curious to see how Red Deck wins would do against uh, the Bug Pod list. Uh, never lucky, right? When the die roll, have a one drop. Seems great. Hand looks fine. Um, it's got a Magma Jet to kind of smooth the top deck out. It's got a Teetering Peaks, which is basically a zero mana shock. Um, at the cost of a land drop, it's got a skewer. I'm not really sure if I'm sold on skewer yet. It's very, very cheap, but I feel like it's more of like... Um, I feel like you generally only throw it at their face. The fact that you have to do damage to make this thing cost one means that it's tough to use it as removal, in my experience, because you generally want to remove their threats before you attack. Generally, you're using your burn as removal when you want to get your creatures through. They luckily do not have a turn one mana dork, which is a very strong favor to me. Um, I play out a Monastery Swiss Sphere, pump, 
get in for lightning bolt damage. They're they're down three. They play on a Sylvan Ranger. I go ahead and Magma Jet on my upkeep to smooth my draw out. I believe I see a Beaumont Courier and a Gitu Encampment. I opt to draw the Gitu Encampment this turn. I actually don't mind drawing Gitu Encampment here. It's, it's a land that actually does something relevant. I could have seen bottoming it as well, but it's kind of like my fourth creature. It's kind of how I'm looking at it. I go ahead and attack here. I like their block. I'm kind of worried they're going to block the uh, the figure of destiny. I'm kind of happy when they block the Bomac Courier. I'm fine two for oneing myself on a Courser of Crew Fix. I think honestly you just have to. I don't think you know you can wait around and allow them to get value off that. Plus it's nice that they're going to draw a land next turn, so I know they're going to draw land. Uh, I do pay the full bounty for Skewer the Critics here, throwing it at their face, pumping the Monastery Mentor, or Swift Spear, to a 2-3, and then attacking for lethal against their Jays. So, on a little bit of a slower draw without a turn 1 Mana Dork on the play, uh, we're able to, to kind of get him here with the, the red deck wins. Um, Alright guys, quick pause, and we'll be back momentarily. Alright guys, we are back. Um... That hand's not keepable. It has a 1 drop, but it has a ton of 4s, and did not have enough mana to develop. This hand's perfect. I mean, it's not perfect. It'd rather have, like, one burn spell, but it's not bad. I play out Jackal Pup. Uh, I have a funny conversation with Ben here. I don't know if Jackal Pup's, like, legitimately correct anymore to play in Red Deck Wins. This is obviously more of, like, um... I think it would have used to have been called, like, like Sped Red. Like, it's it's really a deck that's hyper-tuned to beat control decks because it's running some cards that, um... It's running a much less economic variant of red deck wins. I think right now, like medium red is is what a deck they're 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 calling up there. Uh, it's uh, like basically like you know a bunch of four drops and five drops runs like uh, Soul Ring and Mana Crypt. Um, it runs like the Dragons um, is kind of more in vogue right now uh, because that deck has it's more of a mid range deck and it has the ability to crew more adva card advantage. Whereas the build that I'm running right now is is pretty much just hyper tuned to uh, to be as efficient as possible to punish inefficiencies in in, in any given deck construction. Uh, Jackal Pop not looking so hot right now against a Coiling Oracle. I don't mind if they block with a Death Rite Shaman, but I definitely don't want to get blocked by a Coiling Oracle. So I get pretty lucky here. Um, I end up drawing an Earthshaker Kenra, which was actually a pretty perfect draw because I get to falter the um, Coiling Oracle. And then attack in with both of my threats because I don't think they're going to block the uh, pup on the uh, Death Rite Shaman. Get in for four damage, which is, is pretty big. That was a big draw. Um, I go ahead and just play out my Rampaging Ferocidon. They uh, unfortunately have a Venser Shaper Savant, uh, pushing the uh, Rampaging Ferocidon back to my hand. And now I don't have an attack. I really didn't have a great attack before. I could send in the Earthshaker Kenra, but it's not phenomenal. <clears throat> they cast out a Finx, which. You know, if the Ferocidon had landed, it would have been a lot better. The uh, Diabolic Intent here, which is a sick card. I love this card. Um, I'm like 95% sure they put a um, a Birthing Pot in their hand. So here's my line here. Like, I, I have a Hell Rider that I could have cast this turn. I don't think it does enough this turn. So what I'm trying to do is set up Hell Rider for the following turn. Um, so I can get in like one big hit. Like, because like they're at... Almost 20 life, but Hellrider is one of the ghost cards that, like, if you can get one big hit in, can actually kill them from 20 life. I also want Rampaging Ferocidon down a little bit more than Hellrider right here, because I know I can't kill them this turn with Hellrider, and if somehow I get the turn pass back to me after their turn off of a Birthing Pot activation, and hopefully not... Well, they're going to have a time walk, because what they're going to do is they're going to put a Birthing Pot into play, sack the Coiling Oracle, find uh, Eternal... Uh, not Eternal, it's Spellseeker, uh, get Time Walk, Time Walk with Spellseeker, and then, pr like, if I'm them, I'm hoping to hit into another 2-drop, play 2-drop, sack 2-drop, find uh, Eternal Witness, uh, and then uh, Time Walk again. But hopefully, like, they eventually fizzle, and the Rampaging Ferocidon is able to account for damage, a lot of damage on their turn. And then on my following turn, I can drop Hellrider and just slam, you know, with uh, with a big board. So there is the Birthing Pod, as expected. They sack the Venser Shaper Savant, find Sidisi, sack, or find Sidisi, sack the Coiling Oracle, uh, end up time walking that way. Maybe they wanted to get into a six, uh, like a Progenitor Mimic. They end up sacking the uh, Kitchen Finks, get Archaea Mancer, getting the Time Walk back. Time Walking again while casting a Liliana uh, Last Hope. Uh, they cast Venser, Shaper Savant, bounce my Rampaging Ferocidon, but at this point, I have gotten them down to 13. Um, Alright, so what happened here is this. like 
It I, this game would have gone like so they they t- they should have won this game. Uh, body double does give them the win because they copy the Arcane Mancer, get back the time walk, time walk again, and keep on doing the chain until they can get into Progenitor Mimic on Arcane Mancer. Um, copy Arcane Mancer every turn, get time walks back every turn. You know, time walk every turn basically. Like Arcane Mancer does the same thing that that. Um, Ewit does to, uh, to to loop. And I think there were multiple ways they could have looped. I think they could have either looped up through the three drops or looped up through the uh, the bigger drops, the four drop into five drop with Sidisi. But their, their line makes more sense than the one I was explaining because they just get bigger creatures that can win the game faster this way. They uh, they get unfortunate. Body doubles bug. They should have beat me here. Um, you know, I just go ahead and throw this, this silly... Like, I'm just like, yeah, I mized it and kind of jokingly throw it at them. And then we go to another game because we kind of want to do more testing on this matchup. So this is at a minimum. Like, this red deck wins versus uh, Bug Pod would have gone to a Game 3 here. This is definitely not my win. We just I just jokingly threw the, the price of progress out there for funsies. So, quick pause, guys. I'll be back momentarily. Alright, guys. So, back. So, I'm playing the same deck again. Like, I kind of wanted to retest it. Um, this is a great hand. Like, it's got a turn 1 Burning Tree Emissary. And there's a couple things you could do. I mean, you could just throw the burn at face, throw the incendiary flow at face to to maintain mana efficiency. But I'm probably just going to cast a Zergo Bell Striker out. I um I end up uh, putting down the burning tree, dumping my two two, my uh, my new age Iron Claw Orcs. Uh, I get Inquisition, which kind of stinks because I'd like to have that Searing Blaze. But what can you do? This is where Skewer the Critics is awkward. I just throw it at face because I'm not going to be able to hard cast it against a threat. Um, they level me here, uh, so they play this thing out, and I just throw the incendiary flow at it just to get in there for damage this turn. Um, in, in reality, it was more correct to possibly wait on, on doing that and just trade a creature for it. Because they kind of level me here. They have a, they have a Kitchen Finks in hand, and I'm like, alright, Kitchen Finks it is. Not happy to see that one. I draw a land. I don't really have a great attack into Finks. They drop a Courser, have a Vendillion click on top. Courser is a beating. So I get him pretty low. The, the one thing that kind of goes bad in this hand is um, I have a lot of live draws here. Like, despite their comeback, I have a lot of live draws to get out of this. Um, but I, I kind of un- hit, unfortunately, on lands. Um, you know, they've got a Corsair in play, and I've got one less land than they do. Right now, I basically have the same amount of mana they do. Uh, draw to Abbott. Abbott's not a bad draw, but I know they've drawn a Vendillion click off of uh, basically seeing their top deck with Corsair. Uh, they get rid of the Abbott. I draw a land and say go. They find a Botanical Sanctum on top. They play out uh, Marine of the Clan and the Loth. I think is how it's said. Neltoth. They just start getting threats out to beat me down. They don't want to give me time to draw out. I find another land and just say, all right. So I, I, uh, I, you'd think I would probably concede here normally because it looks like I, they have overwhelming advantage. But I actually do have a line to kill them. This last turn, it was Price of Progress. Now my line to win this game is pretty specifically light up the stage into both... Fire Blast and Price of Progress for 16 damage. Um, that's my only out. Um, and I tell them, like, yep, my only out's this. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they're getting all kinds of value off Marine, getting free Phantasmal Image back. That's going to copy the Kitchen Finks, gain them two life, back up to 16. Yep, there is the Finks. So I go ahead and fetch on Upkeep. Like, legitimately just for thinning. I draw one-third of my combo of cards, and then I just hard cast it for lulls. Just like, there you go, buddy. All right, so game one in the books. Quick pause, guys, and we'll come back for game two in this match set. All right, guys, back. This hand is great. This is exactly what we want to see in this matchup. We've got an arc trail to kind of eat some of their mana dorks. Got a turn one threat. Got a three and a four. Like, pretty good. Pretty solid. Also, now I have a two-drop. Never lucky, right? So burn this this Deathrite Shaman off because they probably have a fetch land they can tech into. Uh, they play on a Baleful Strix. I so I make an interesting play here. What I do, like this is kind of a I'm trying to now level him. He leveled me with the Finks. I'm trying to level him. I really want to pass damage through with Jackal Pup this turn specifically. So I play my Sin Prod route main one to be like, hey. If you wait on blocking with Baleful Strix, maybe you can block the Sin Prodder. Because I really don't need Sin Prodder to last more than one turn. I just want it to get a little bit of damage in off of a draw step or give me a free card. And then trade with whatever nonsense he plays. I do end up getting a free Skull Crack, which is not irrelevant. And again, because the, the Menace requires this thing gets double blocked, I it, the Baleful Strix eats it here. But Jackalpup's gotten in for four at this point. Pretty much four free damage. 
Actually, six at this point, six damage. Jackalope's done a lot of work this game. Despite being a, a little bit of an outdated card, Jackalope is doing some significant work for me. Uh, I just get a Mauler down. Uh, go ahead and attack with all. They uh, opt to block the Mauler and the Pup. And the three damage gets through, putting them to seven. So if they take one damage in any way, whether it be through a Birthing Pot activation, a Fetch Land, like here, and I draw a land, which I do, then I can kill them. I just go Flame Rift and Bolts. Well, they, they know I have Skull Crack because they gave it to me off of my, my Menace Critter. Uh, but it was either Skull Crack or Incinerate here. Anyways, guys, quick pause, and we'll jump back into uh, game number three in this match. All right, guys, back. Um, that hand's not keepable. Has no mana. All right, so this is my worst keep of this is my worst keep of all the games I play against Ben. Um, why do I keep this hand? Well, I think five is too low against him. I think his deck is too grindy and has too much too much card advantage for me to win on a three or I'm sorry on a five. This hand can cast spells. Outside, and it has a scry. It can cast spells, and it has a scry. It also has a shrine of burning rage. So if by some miracle they don't have a way to get after a reclamation sage or a thing that answers artifacts enchantments, then shrine of burning rage can win the game all on its own. This is not really the matchup where I think shrine shines that much, but you know, what are you gonna do? I draw into uh, burn. I actually top scryed that wild slash to template against a mana dork. They play land, say go. Play out the uh, shrine of burning rage. And we see a miracle happen here. They do not have a land. So I play out my Abbot of Carol Keep, main one, uh, looking for land or a one-drop. Don't find either. Uh, trap the Lightning Mauler in Exile. And then just play out my G2 Lava Runner. <laughs> they play out a Noble Hierarch here. I actually briefly consider Shrine of Burning Raging the, the Noble Hierarch, but then I opt against it. I'm just like, that can't be right. It just can't possibly be right. Um... They develop into a Wood Elves, put a tapped uh, Overgrown Tomb into play, and now they have a blocker for my Abbot. I could try attacking with Abbot here, but like, it's a pretty free roll for them to block the Abbot with the Wood Elves, so I think it's a pretty bad bluff. It's a horrible bluff, really. They play a Vanifar out here, and this is like one of the most challenging spots I'm putting to in this game, I think. You know... It, realistically, I could survive one Vanifar activation... Because they don't have a two drop in play, I know they can't get after Spellseeker. Well, I know on board they can't get after Spellseeker and play a time walk. However, if they in six cards, like five plus a draw step, if they have any two drop, then I probably just lose this game to Vanifar. Uh, speaker, what is this? Prime Speaker Vanifar. Yeah, I probably lose to her. So I go to my my next turn because I don't think mana is going to be a constraint. Oops, I'm pushing okay like I'm playing this game again. I go to my main as opposed to blowing up Vanifar and their end step uh, to see what my draw step is going to be because I there's not any spells in my deck that I'm going to be restricted from both activating Shrine and or casting. So it's pretty much a free roll on decision. I blow up the Vanifar here. I, I don't like doing it, but I think I had to. They don't block any of my stuff with their Wood Elf, so evidently they want to use it for like a sack effect. Um, they have the uh, Eternal Witness in hand. They get back the land, play out the Lily, blow up my 2-1 with Lily. I finally mize, and because of Menace or Menace, I think they, I think the Canadians call it Menace. <laughs> I'm kidding, guys. But uh, the 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 uh, this dude, what's this idiot called? Stormblood Berserker, uh, M M12 card here or whatever it is, or M11 card, uh, ends up getting through uh, because of Menace, and then I have the other two damage off of the uh, the, the key two lava runner. You finally got haste, buddy. Um, so what do I think of the matchup? I actually think that um, this variant, and and if you guys want, at the end I'm gonna cover one more game with a different deck that I played against the same deck Ben's playing. Um, I'll cover my build of red deck wins because like I. I think Red Deck wins a really interesting deck uh, from a lot of perspectives. Like, I think it's a great deck for entry level uh, because it's very cheap. Uh, but I also think it's actually kind of um, an interesting. It offers a lot of st interesting strategic decisions. Now, this game, these games, kind of per se did not because like I either just had a nut nut opener or I had kind of like an opener like this where like I kept a more landed hand because I didn't want to go to five and I kind of bricked off a lot. Like I bricked off heavy. Now I'm playing thirty. I'm playing thirty-two lands, what the actual deck counter says, but I consider it more of a thirty-land deck, um, or I consider it more of a thirty-one-land deck. So I have a, a Mistress Factory, a Mutaval, and a Wasteland that I kind of all template is not lands, but I'm also playing um, uh, the the Mox and the Black Lotus in this list. So it's more of like a thirty-one-land deck with with three lands that are just solely in there for utility. Um, 
So it, it is a little bit more landed to be played on Moto, so you don't just completely screw and just don't develop your hand. But it's not so high that like you should be drawing, you know, what is this, six, seven, eight, eight lands um, in the top 15. No, that's pretty poor luck. Anyway, you know, we do manage to get there. So I do think the matchup is actually not that bad. I think it's pretty close to, like, 50-50 or, like, maybe even slight edge, like, very, very, very slight edge um, to, to red deck wins, um, you know. But it's really draw-dependent, right? Because if they hit their turn one mana dork, I just don't have the answer, which this deck has a lot of answers to mana dorks. Uh, but if I just don't, like, they can definitely get there pretty easily because that, that, the mana dork is big, like, especially on the play. If they go to three... Uh, well, I'm only at one mana in play. It's it's a pretty big game, uh, you know. So I, I think it is die roll dependent. Maybe it's more of a fifty fifty matchup. Honestly, looking at it, you know, I, I'm looking at it and thinking of like how these games played out and like you know the the variance in my draws. But I also had the play in both games, which is pretty big. Um, so, anyways, guys, I'm gonna go on a quick pause. We'll go into uh, the third game that I played against, or the fourth game I played against Ben. Oh yeah, the fourth game I played against Ben um, here momentarily. All right, guys, back. I'm playing some uh, Dark Jess guy here. This this hand looks fine. Um, it's it's got the ability to cast a turn one Inquisition. Um, you know, it's got two pointed cards in it. It's got a Snapcaster Mage, which is pretty good. It's got a Preordain to help develop the mana base and or find answer cards to, to creatures. Um, I am going to Inquisition on turn one as opposed to Preordain on turn one because I want to get any mana dorks out of their hand. So I end up finding Badlands here because I think red mana is going to be necessary. I actually have an interesting call here. I'm not sure if it's more correct. So I have some choices, right? I could get Time Walk. I can get Wall Blossoms, or I can get Leovold. Their hand actually... So their hand um, does not have enough mana to cast the three drops in it right now. They'll probably draw into it because they're more landed deck. Wall of Blossoms and Time Walk are kind of similar cards in the early game if you're just using them for an explore effect. They're actually pretty similar that way because I mean, it's just really a draw and an untap with Time Walk as opposed to just a draw and a blocker with uh, with uh, Wall of Blossoms. I'm not really an attack deck, so I opt to just take the Time Walk. Um, I could have also seen Leovold being decently correct, but I, I end up taking the Walk here because I think Walk is, uh, is a little more... Uh, a little more intelligent to take. Um, I'm kind of sad like, to to have to have not been able to not play a land out first before that because I have a tap land on the next turn. So they make an interesting play here. Um, they play on a wooded foothills and fetch for a bayou. Uh, I'm automatically writing down on my notepad. They drew into blue mana uh, because they would definitely have fetched for blue mana if they had not drawn it that turn. So they drew a land that turn, and their their line of play tells us that they did. Play on a Scalding Tarn, which is probably the land they drew on the previous turn. Play on a Wood Elves to get more mana fixing here. Find a uh, Breeding Pool. I'm going to leave my mana up this turn. I could have tried slamming a True Name Nemesis, but if they resolve a Vanifar, I can't answer it right now. Unless I exactly hit a land. I do go ahead and get rid of uh, Evasive Action, because I'm hoping to set up the Dig Through Time here. I draw into a land... And they have Stifle Bird. I did not know they had Stifle Bird. That's not very unfortunate. So now I just go for a preordain because I really want to set up my top deck. And if they drop Vanifar, then I can Jace. I, I'm thinking in my head if I get an untapped land, I can Jace it. I can't Jace it, guys. So they Court of Calling and find Glenelandra, which is a lot better for me than them playing Vanifar, I think. It's not good, but I actually do run a lot of creatures in my deck. So I end up playing the TNN here. They, I, I don't know what they wanted to do. I think they accidentally ca cast the Snapcaster. I think it was a misclick. Because they, they end up not courting at all. I just play my dudes out. I'm trying to race at this point. I, I know the Jays can't resolve because of Glenelandra. I'm leaving up the Spell Pierce to get some value, I guess, if they play a spell. They get Vanifar down, finally. And I go in for the, uh, the, the Funzies attacks. I know I'm dead. I'm very, very dead next turn. I get him down to four, play out the uh, the Grim Lava Mancer, and now you get to see what their deck does. Their deck does some sweet stuff. So they get the Eternal Witness, Time Walk back, Time Walk cast, into their next turn. Well, they get in for five damage here, put me down to ten. Next turn, sack Eternal Witness, find Archaeomancer, Archaeomancer gets back Time Walk, Time Walk gets cast. 
They attack for five. Actually, unearth here. I try to. I spell pierce this just for for uh, uh, for F six value. That's what I tell them. Like, ah, F six value, man. Uh, they get eternal witness back. Time walk again after unearthing to get eternal witness. Attack for five. Put me down to uh, uh, eight because I block. Uh, sack to get body double. Body double is definitely bugged, but they just went with damage anyways. They attack me for lethal, and I am dead. Um, I was dead anyways off body double, but you get to see their deck kind of do the full combo here. Unfortunately, on Moto, body double is bugged, but body double should come into play as a copy of Archaeomancer, more than likely. Uh, gets back the time walk. They cast the time walk with the two available, randomly enough, uh, floating a mana that is available in their pool. Um, and they win, and they, you know, time walk again. Um, so anyways, that's how game one played out uh, with Dark Jeskai Aggro against the uh, the Bug Pod deck. Quick pause, guys. We'll be back for game number two. Alrighty, guys, back. I like this hand. Um, this hand's got some early disruption against a Mana Dork. It's got some hand disruption. The one funny thing about this hand is its mana is kind of screwy like it was in the first game. Um, it has to fetch a Badlands here to be able to fix for Is It Charm, which takes me off of white. Uh, but it's a four-color deck that's non-green, so it's going to have those issues. We look at their hand, we have two options. We have Wall of Blossoms and Sylvan Ranger. Their hand is going to have Constriction on mana, possibly. So I end up taking the Sylvan Ranger, because I know Sylvan Ranger finds them a land. I don't know that Wall of Blossoms will find them a land. And most of my threats fly, and or have Evasion or go wide. Uh, they just play on a tap land. I play on a tap land, say go. They play out their old Wall Blossoms. Say go again to me. I'm actually looking to probably cast Is It Charm just to loot here because I have enough irrelevant cards in my hand that I really need to hit land drops to get Jace down. So I loot. I ditch the Delver and the Jeskai Charm here. End up finding a, a Brainstorm, which I probably would have rather discarded over like Jeskai Charm or Delver here. I just play Jace out to start getting value. Draw into some more cards. Find a Fire Ice. Say go. Even if they resolve a Glenelandra or a Saskia here, like it's not really that big of a deal. So they cast in a Tumor Exarch to attack my hand. I believe they discard the Path to Exile. Yep. And I am just drawing all the cards. I keep Days in hand, and I resolve a Lingering Souls, then ponder to Shuffle, I believe. Yeah, I shuffle it up. I get a JVP, which JVP's alright. I mean, he can buy back Jeskai Charm, which is a lot of damage and or life gain. Um, I could also put something on, back on top of my deck. I just daze this. I'm going to daze pretty much anything I can daze here just to get some value and put them back on tempo. I let Jace, I believe, go down to one. I'd rather have the spirits as threats to kill them. I'm trying to win this game. Uh, the deck I'm playing like is a Dark Jeskai list, but it's a Dark Jeskai aggressive list. More of an aggro control list is what I would call it. Um, I just go ahead and get in there for my two. Now I have a blocker for the Entumor Exarch that is pretty tough to deal with. They play on a Saskia. Or Sakashima, I'm sorry. Not Saskia. Saskia is a different card. That's a, 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 a four-color blood card. Um, I just take the damage here. Cast the back half of Lingering Souls to get more dudes down. Play on a Geist of St. Traff. They're boxed into having to attack with their uh, uh, Sakashima to kill my Jace. Jace is down, but I don't really care. Like Jace is not that relevant to me right now. I just start blowing stuff up with Chain Lightnings and, and, and Fire Ices, and I'm just going to kill them here is what I'm going to do. Uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, uh, blow this thing up on the first half, then Fire Ice the other half of it, attack in, um, and, and probably just get them. Actually, I could probably just blow up the Entumor X arc, and then they can't kill the Geist and Blocks. Uh, I don't think I actually have straight up lethal on just the Creeping Tizzle, Creeping Tar Picks. It's six damage gets through, plus four... Uh, yeah, they could block. They they have enough blockers to block Geist. Uh, the, the they'd have to block with the uh, the back half of Glenelandra um, on the the um, Angel, and then they could block with the Entumor Exarch. So it wouldn't quite be lethal, but it's a lot of damage. So, anyways, they go ahead and pack it in here. I I you know just uh, Jace was an, gave me enough gave me enough cards and tempo and time um, to to allow me to get into a position to actually just attack them to death. So, anyways, guys, quick pause, and I'll be right back. All right, guys, back. Hey, looks great. So it's got some early interaction in the form of days and arc trail to deal with onboard threats. And it's got a baleful Strix as kind of a free roll, plus um, you know a good blocker for green, big green idiots. Play out a tap sunken hollow because it's not likely to come into play untapped. 
Fauna Shaman, that's going to go right to the yard. I'm going to blow that thing up with uh, Diabolic Edicts. I could have possibly wanted to collect a Brutality them there, but I'm not sure if I want to ditch a land yet on this hand. So I have Baleful Strix here. Take damage off Godless Shrine and just look at their hand. Get rid of Garuk. So they have a Court of Calling. Let me go on a quick pause, guys, so we can look at their hand. So they have Court of Calling, uh, Reclamation Sage, and Hostage Taker. What do we think they do? I like how they play this. They know that they know that I have days. They don't play into days, which is really. I think it's a strong play. I like that line from them. But it also does run into my uh, arc trail pretty well. So I run a force of will, which there's not many better draws. That was a great draw to protect. I get rid of the cord with the collective brutality. So like we're kind of just pummeling our poor opponent here. I draw an ancestral recall. I'm just getting so lucky here. And I'm sorry, buddy. I daze this so I don't have a land drop for the turn as it currently stands. Play my land back out. Play a Jace the Mind Sculptor out. Top them. See a, a flash threat, which I don't really want to have to deal with, so I put it on the bottom. They draw pretty well, though. They do get a Jace the Mind Sculptor. I end up Force of Willing it, pitching Delver. I have an onboard Jace. I know they have a Hostage Taker in hand, which is pretty worthless. I have a Tutor that can tutor for anything in my deck, and even Mind Sensor as a threat to finish it off, plus a card engine in the form of Jace, and slash Wincon in the form of Jace. So they go ahead and pack it in. I had a pretty strong draw here that templated well against their hand, and I had perfect knowledge through use of cards like Duress and Collective Brutality to be able to kind of get after them. Uh, but my draw was also stellar. Like, you know, I, I cannot say it was not. I mean, like, Force of Will and Ancestral Recall was, was not bad. Anyways, guys, hope you guys enjoyed the uh, content. These are my games against Ben. Uh, I don't know if we'll get more in today before uh, before he ships me back my uh, my, my deck but uh, or my cards. But um, very, very cool deck. I love his, his Bug Pod deck. I think if we play again, we're probably going to be doing some more Blue-Red X matchups because I think that's what he wanted to test against. Anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed, and uh, take care now.